Hello, welcome back. This is the Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster from Contact Renovation to Custom Homes. And uh, we've been on a bit of a hiatus. It's been about a month or so since we had the show. And uh, we're back and we're talking about um, bathroom tile. We're gonna give you the lowdown on bathroom tile. And it's a huge, um, it makes a huge difference who does your tile install because it can be a catastrophic failure, but it's not done right. So I'm not here to scare you, we're here to educate you, but um, tile, it can make or break your project. And when it comes to waterproofing, you cannot cut a corner. Um, our guest today is Aaron Brown from the River City Tile Company. Um, if you don't know about the River City Tile Company, you should look into it because if there is a magician in the city um, who should do your tile, I would say it's Aaron. Uh, these guys do beautiful work. So I can see they're, they've tuned in. So I will introduce Aaron. I'll bring him on because uh, this guy is an expert. And I mean that literally. Um, so at the very least, you need to talk to Aaron to get an education about tile because um, you can put a lot of money into your bathroom project. But if that waterproofing fails or your tile's not installed properly, um, it really, really can be disheartening because there is no cheap way to fix a bad tile job. Anyhow, so let me grab a picture here. I'm going to just put up uh, some information about Aaron while I'm talking about him. Bear with me. Instagram does their updates and changes the format all the time on me here. Okay, so Aaron Brown, he is the founder of the River City Tile Company. He and his wife, Chelsea, um, opened up the River City Tile Company back in 2011. Um, Aaron's been in the tile business for about 20 years. His love for beautiful ceramics started as a teenager um, when he worked in his family's tile manufacturing facility helping hand press and paint um, artisan ceramics. From there he wanted to become an expert tile setter specializing in high-end custom projects. Uh, his attention to detail and creativity have earned him a reputation as a tile setting magician here in Edmonton. His shop, the River City Tile Company, um, stocks whatever you need to make your project special, unique, and exciting from traditional to contemporary, the latest technologies. So they really have, um, you know, top-notch stuff there. So you go check out the showroom. I'm going to bring Aaron on here. Give me a sec. All right. And we'll get the conversation started here. Just once. There he is. Oh, we better back up. Hey, Aaron. Oh, how's it going? Good. Welcome back. Thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you. I made sure I wore the same shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I probably have the same stuff on too because I always wear this sweater in my office. So there you go. Anyhow, so, you know, the show today is called uh, The Lowdown on Bathroom Tile. And I decided to dedicate an entire show to it because. We've seen so many shockingly bad installs done and not always intentional, right? I mean, people like to try and set tile. Hey, I did it. When I started this company, I was like, okay, I can set tile too. And there's a huge learning curve to it. And technology has changed a lot. And unfortunately, one thing that hasn't changed is there's not much for regulation when it comes to tile setting. So, uh, you know, if we have electrical work done or plumbing work or gas fitting, there's a permit pull, there's an inspector who comes and that is all set up to help keep the homeowner protected from bad work, right? Yeah. Well, the tile setting industry doesn't have that. And so I think today we should talk a bit about, you know, what to look out for when you're choosing a tile setter. Talk a bit about, you know, the truth of install practices and why somebody's quote to do a tile install can be so different in price. You can't tell from the surface of the finish perhaps, but it's underneath that really counts, right? So I think we'll start with that for now. So I think, you know, as I would, I'll call you safely a tile expert because I know how passionate you are about it. You've been doing it for a long time and the stuff that you do doesn't fail. Uh, you're an artist, we call you a magician because in the end you do these installs that um, are kind of show stoppers. And at the same time, it's one thing to look beautiful, but it's got to stand the test of time. So I guess, what's my question? 
let's start with, give us a bit of background as to what you think, where we're at right now with the tile setting trade. And then we'll talk about some questions that we should ask tile setters. If they aren't hiring you, or they're getting multiple quotes, who, or they're planning to do it themselves, what are some key questions to ask? I know that's a mouthful, I'm sorry. But oh, good. let's uh, start from there. Okay, so where's the trade at right now? Um, well, I can tell you, I mean, we've had River City Tile Company for 10 years, or just about, or almost there. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna be at 10 years uh, in this calendar year. And I started River City Tile Company as a tile installer. I was a guy with a van and a set of tools essentially. And uh, it, I quickly realized that I was gonna have to rely on other tile installers to do all the work that we had. Um, and so I had to find tile installers with a like mind. In other words, somebody that was uh, willing to do what we were proposing for our clients. We did do a lot of really interesting designs, as you mentioned. Some of them are simple. We do the same, you know, three by six subway tile installations as well. But we needed to find like-minded individuals. And that's, that, I found that very, very challenging. There's so many tile guys that are out there that are willing to do work. Um, but they're not necessarily willing to do it the way that you want it done or the way that it should be done or the way that the client wants it done. And so uh, trying to, there's, there's sort of, in my mind, there's sort of like two types of tile installers. There's the guys that sort of don't know what else to do. They don't really, you know, they grew up setting tile or, you know, they kind of fell into the trade and they wake up in the morning, they're talking. And then you get like the guy that they're like, I'm a, like they just like eat, sleep and breathe it. Right. And they're so passionate. Mm -hmm. You can tell when you open a box of really complex material, some guys are like, oh, really? Like, you want me to do this? And then you get the other guys that are like, oh, man, I'm so glad I get the opportunity to work. With it's like a carpenter getting to work with, like, really high-end exotic real wood versus MDF, right? So, yeah, you know, there's there's those two types of, uh, of installers. But overall, the trade is, in fact, sort of dying. Um, uh, as technology has advanced, we have the wedges now. Uh, so tile setting is becoming less of a uh, less of a craft, uh, and the expectations are just not there like they used to be. So, um, from a design perspective, uh, you know, the finish is, is is not what it used to be. It's a lot simpler, cost effective, and most people don't even know that there is a difference. Uh, to be honest. In, in what's available, that's where we that's where we specialize in is is getting the client every detail. Uh, so you mentioned it off the top that um, uh, you know you might look like you did a good job, but did you actually do a good job? Uh, it's what's underneath that counts. We we kind of do both, right? We make sure that not only is it as good looking as it could possibly be, and it's going to last a very long and. Those are two things that are really, really hard to find hand in hand nowadays. It was an interesting point you made, Paul, earlier about how uh, tile setters are, there's accountability. There's no school left in Alberta for tile setters. There used to be. Uh, about five years ago, um, it, uh, the Red Steel program for tile setters. And um, I found that, like, understandable some ways because nobody asks any questions. Uh, you hire a child guy, usually it's based on the price or you got a name from someone and then that's it. You just tell them this is the tile and there's the room and then off he goes and you don't actually know, uh, you know, you don't know what thin set he's using, you don't know how he's installing the membrane, there's no inspector that comes in and says, yep, that shower is waterproof. And so it can be a little bit, uh, it can be a little bit scary like when I think about it. Um, you know, you're, you're putting all this trust into a major, major investment, right? And like you said, if something goes wrong with tile, uh, and it has, like, don't get me wrong, we've witnessed some pretty uh, catastrophic failures in our, you know, in this almost 25 years. And uh, it's not an easy fix. And, um, and so it's like, it's better to do it right the first time and get what you want uh, aesthetically as well. Uh, there's too many contractors and uh, tile guys out there that are sort of driving the clients want their away from what they want and more into like what's easier as opposed to like you know what looks the best but um yeah we've seen that and i would say that you know one thing i've seen a, a lot more of is like tile getting categorized into flooring and in many ways it is flooring but 
in it, my opinion, it's it's very different when you get into into a shower build and into an area where things get wet because now you have to factor so much more into it. Um, how does the Wi-Fi connection seem on your end, Aaron? It seems good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm getting some feedback on my side here, but um, if anybody has any issues with sound, let me know because I can't really tell on my end. So we'll just, we'll push ahead here. Um, one surprise I've run into on today's show is that I just downloaded the new update for Instagram and I can no longer see um, a way to add images. So I don't know if Instagram's removed that feature from the live show or what here, but I'll I'll play around in the background here, see if I can get some images up. Otherwise, you'll be looking at us two handsome devils the whole time. And, uh, but I mean, there's a lot to talk about here. So, um, okay, I got some feedback that Aaron is cutting out. Well, you look better now. For a while there, you looked a bit grainy, Aaron, and and there was some feedback, but I think our signal looks good. So we'll just, we'll keep going here. So I would say, like, let's start, let's talk, start with waterproofing. I know we, we said we'd we talked about questions to ask the Talisker, but let's get through a bit of the technical side of the install. Um, oh, and then uh -huh. we'll we'll talk about some educated questions for people to ask their installer uh, a little bit later in the show. Okay. So, when you get into building a custom shower, now we have some options there, but let's talk about the start at the very like common install issues. So, usually on my end, when I find a problem with the shower it's either it wasn't the, there wasn't a membrane used or wasn't waterproof properly or like any tile install it wasn't installed on the proper substrate so it wasn't didn't have a solid enough subfloor or some combination of products to to tile on top of so wh where do you start generally when you guys come in to to build a shower what's step one nope Maybe we're cutting out down there too. All right. Well, the joy of the live. Oh, there you are. I hear you now. My back. You back. That was, <laughs> that was actually my wife just called me in the middle of this thing, probably to tell me that I should be on your interview. Okay. Um, okay. So, what are the common things with waterproofing? So. Waterproofing is uh, and just substrates in general. So what's interesting is that there's so many different waterproofing systems and unfortunately everyone seems to have their own interpretation about how they should be installed. It's so simple to just it, follow the manufacturer's guidelines. There's lots of really effective waterproofing systems out there and subfloor membranes as well. And um, for whatever reason, we still see tile being an, installed on top of directly on top of plywood. Um, you know, we've, we've just learned that over the last, I don't know, I mean, we've been using subfloor membranes for over 15 years without exception on our floors. And sometimes that loses us the job, um, to be honest. Like, there's, there's lots of times where a guy will just say, oh, you don't need that subfloor membrane. And now he's cheaper. And now I'm the bad guy because I'm trying to like, you know, take advantage of a client and say, well, I, I'm going to throw this like extra cost at you kind of thing, right? When in fact, we're just trying to do it right. Um, and the waterproofing is, is something else that's interesting. You know, the reality is, is that the tile setting trade has been, um, you know, I started doing this. I, I worked for a flooring store in the city about 20 years ago. And my, my rate back then was what they're paying today, it, like dollar for dollar to the penny. So if it was, you know, $4 a square foot back then, it's $4 a square foot today. And you can't make any money at that rate. And so what guys do is they end up figuring out ways to make it less expensive. So if a, if a waterproof system is, is quoted and spec there's no accountability. There's nobody checking to make sure if he got the right waterproof system or he... Uh, he or she, um, you know, is using it properly. And so they can kind of get away with using it. And by the time the shower leaks or, you know, you figure out what the problem is, it's it's too late by then. The guy's already paid and, you know, he's on to the next one. So, you know. Absolutely. I think, like, let's let's just pause for one sec here because that's, that's a key. This is key. Like, if you're hiring a towel setter, you need to make sure that you're poking your head in on site throughout the installation process because, you may have specced whatever it is, Schluter or Kurt, whatever it is going to be for the membrane for that system. 
but you won't, if you're not there to check in on it, you won't know. You better be asking for progress photos and you want to make sure they've done it right. Cause I've seen guys come in before who, yes, they bought the right product, but they didn't install it properly. Yeah. So they did the joints wrong. So in the end, any moisture that got behind the tile ran right down the wall and past the pan. And now yeah. we have a problem below, right? So it's, it's really, because there is no regulating body at this point, I think it's key that, you know, if you're a homeowner hiring a tile setter, you need to make sure that you check in on the work. If you're not too sure what you're looking for, then have a good conversation with your tile setter. Because you will never know until, you know, depends how bad the, the leak is, you won't find out until there's a problem visible later. And by then your tile setter is long gone or your general contractor is long gone. So when it's under an umbrella like mine, there's protection there because there's a warranty or a company like yours where you're legit and you're not a fly by night operation. But when you have these installers around who kind of just come and go, you really have no, there's no warranty. Right. So well, we, in order to ensure that sort of like double insulate ourselves from it, um, I made a, a decision a long, long time ago that we actually supply all the material for our, not just our employed tile setters, but also our subcontractors. So when a subcontractor does a job for River City Tile Company, River City Tile Company supplies them with the mortar, with the grout, with the waterproof membrane, the drain assembly, and everything else. And we do that just to ensure like continuity, right? Some guys will find they prefer one thing over another and there, there's no other there's no reason necessarily for them to use it other than they just like the way it looks better or, or smells out of the box or whatever the case may be so to to maintain consistency we make sure because i man, like you know you think when i very first started uh hiring contractors i was shocked at how like you know oh yeah i do it I, everyone's the best tile guy in the world until you know <laughs> until they get a and it, you know, to get the team that we have now, we went through a lot of guys, a lot of guys to get to where we are now. Yeah, I can imagine that's um, no doubt. So for anybody just tuning in, this is the Art of Renovation Live. Today we're talking about, we're giving you the lowdown on bathroom tile. And I got Aaron Brown here from the River City Tile Company. And so we're kind of giving you the heads up here about what to look for in your tile set or what's going to set them apart from someone who either doesn't know enough or doesn't care enough. Right. So, um, so the first things first is you got to find out what is the waterproof membrane or what system are they using to make sure that when they build your shower, it's not going to leak. So wh what do you use on your end, Aaron, when you guys are doing installs, do you have a go-to system that you use or? Uh, well, yeah. So we kind of have a, like a formula that we use depending on the circumstance. So almost without exception, we use we do a dry pack base, which is like an old school method of a slope uh, to the drain using a concrete product rather than a foam pan. Um, we do that for a few reasons. It's it's a better, it's just a way better, way safer. You know, the Schluter pans are engineered in a certain way, but it limits the type of material that you can use on top of them. Um, yeah, there's there's different reasons for it, but ultimately we do a ton of barrier free showers now. Like nine point nine out of ten is barrier free, and they're almost always a retrofit. In other words, the house wasn't like built with a big sunken down area to create that curbless shower, um, and so you know the only way to achieve like a really minimal uh, floor profile for a sloped shower is uh, is to to use the dry pack system, which is like a tile setter. It's like a tile. Uh, you learn that in school. And I've run into guys where they come in, they want to be a tile guy at River City Tile. They've never dry packed before because they've only ever used the styrofoam bases. So yeah, it, just uh, just to clarify for anybody who doesn't know what uh, barrier free means for a shower, that's a curbless shower. So your average shower has a like a four inch curb, a little step you need to go over top of to get in the shower, and. So a curbless shower means it's just one level floor surface. So you walk, you have nothing to step over. And that's, that's great. It looks slick. It's nice and clean looking, but also, you know, if it's, it's considered barrier free. So if someone was in a wheelchair or had some sort of handicap, um, then you, you, it helps. You have to step over a curb to get in there. And it, it's, it's interesting because it does, it looks like incredible. It, it makes your, your, your bathroom look way bigger. 
And you know, when you do a shower, it's almost like building a room inside a room. When you take that curb away, it's just like one big room, one big floor surface. It looks. If you're concerned about like using your floor tile into the shower area because they're larger, you're worried about slip. There's uh, all kinds of uh, one-time treatments uh, that basically turn your wet floor into sandpaper. And believe it or not, even though it looks more high-end and it looks more custom, um, you know, you'll, you, you see it in more high-end uh, homes, for example. The barrier-free shower, if you do a curb properly versus not doing a curb, barrier-free is, in our world, typical less expensive than doing a curb. There's way fewer components. There's less cost uh, to the, uh, the threshold, especially if you're doing like a solid surface on your threshold. It's a lot of work to tile a curb front, back, do a threshold on the top, mm -hmm. out or whatever you got to do. Uh, if you eliminate that, it can, save, it can actually save you money. So you get a better look, you get better function with the barrier free, and you can actually, it's, it's cheaper. <laughs> so yeah. well, really I guess let's talk about that for a second because in, you know, historically for us, it's always been a significant upgrade to go to curbless. And we haven't had you do one of our curbless showers yet. And I'm curious, we've always had to, on, our, on the carpentry side, had to come in and modify floor joists to be able to recess a pan. That's what our former tile setters would tell us was the way to do it. Or build up the shower floor, but then you end up with, you know, a step into the bathroom, which is kind of counterproductive when you're trying to go curbless. So what's yeah. your process for you guys when you build your, your barrier-free showers? Uh, well, as I see there's a bunch of tile guys tuned in right now, so I'd love to tell them how we do it, but uh, I'll, I'll go into it. So basically, because there is no sort of book and there is no like right way to do it, um, you kind of have to go off of like what makes sense based on everything you know. And what we know is that as long as you start with a perfectly level perimeter, and the drain is the lowest part of the floor, water will always go into the drain. And so you don't need like a ton of slope towards that drain, especially if you're using really big tiles. So, you know, we might only need a 1% slope instead of a 2% slope, like it says in the book. Um, based, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of factors that go into it, but you know, Paul, generally speaking, if you were to take an older home, for example, if you took a laser and stuck it on the floor and you took your measuring tape from one end of the room to the other, there's a possibility you could be out three quarters of an inch at a level, like over five feet. You don't even know. It's just the way that the floor is twisted and slopes up and down. And um, more often than not, three quarters of an inch is, is enough slope to sort of slope towards a drain from anywhere. And... Mm -hmm. And if we can use that to our advantage, there's a whole bunch of different ways we do it depending on the size of the floor. But I mean, we've retrofitted four foot by eight foot shower floors. Um, one, of the, one of the key components is that for some reason, uh, people think you need a, like a linear drain to do a barrier. I don't know where that came from, but uh, the square drain is definitely the easiest way to go. It's the most cost effective. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and, and it makes it way easier to, to, to get a barrier free uh, shower out of it. So um, there's lots of different scenarios, but we kind of approach it the same way each time. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll slope up to where the glass is going to go. And then we slope back down towards the drain. But that slope up is so gradual that you don't even know it's there. And then you know, we'll, we'll, we'll float that slope up over four, six feet, like whatever it takes to make that slope basically disappear. And the advantage to doing it that way too is that we've seen on some barrier free installations where people get their glass door and they go to open their door, but the floor is actually going up on the outside mm -hmm. of it. So for sloping up and that, that door will always clear that slope every single time. Sometimes you can even get a bath mat <laughs> on the yeah. outside or and open the door out. So, I mean, I don't know, we've been doing it for so long we've done so many showers now and we've been doing it for so long that um you know it's it's new to kind of the industry it's starting to become like a normal thing in most people's lexicon but i mean we've been doing it for forever so there's just no there's just no circumstance that we haven't been able to do a barrier free shower and even on a basement floor where it's all one level concrete we'll get you get you a barrier free shower nice cool well i have i have like all these amazing pictures i plan to show both of the beautiful work you've done, different options. I have some great um, 
tile fail photos I was going to show, but their Instagram must have removed the ability to post photos while I have a guest on the show, which is um, a serious downer because I had some really cool photos to show you guys. So um, I guess we'll just keep going and that is what it is for now. Um, well, yeah, so. All right, so waterproofing, curbless showers. So one thing when I was looking for tile fail photos yesterday, um, I noticed one of the most common was was common ones was when people didn't apply um, the whether it's the mastic or the thin set or whatever your your mortar bed properly to the tile. We saw some people had little globs on the back and left kind of hollow spaces, but most of them when you saw a lot of water damage and mold and mildew build up. When you pop the tile off, you'd see these little polka dots everywhere um, where there was that adhesive holding the tile in a, in a couple spots only. So can we talk a bit about that? Sure. Yeah, this is going to be crazy. Like, I don't expect anyone to actually heed this advice. But if you go online, there's, there's a little video called Trowel and Error. And uh, for a contractor, certainly a tile installer, it will... It will um, I show every single guy that ever worked five minutes at our store this video. It's called Travel and Air, and it shows how to properly call. Oh, I think you cut out there. I can't hear you. Oh. Nope. nope, I don't hear you. Nope, maybe we'll be back in a sec here. I got video, but no audio on you there, Aaron. How about this? Um, let's, let's see here. Maybe I'll boot you off and bring you back on and see if that, uh, if that helps. Bear with me here. All right. Technical difficulties on the live show. It's classic form. Okay. Nope. That's not it either. Sorry. I thought I found a way to put pictures on, but that's not it. They can let, I can put filters on. All right. So look at that. Aaron's off now and my icon to put pictures on is back up. So I'm assuming Instagram must have just switched it up and made it so you have a guest. You can't show pictures, which is unfortunate because... Uh, we heavily rely on the picture aspect of things here. So we'll have to figure that one out. All right. Let's see if we can find Aaron again here. And we'll get him back on and hopefully his audio is sorted out. Mm -mm -mm. Bear with me. Okay. Try this again. There you go. Oh, there you go. All right. So, sorry, Paul, there's uh, every time I get a phone call, it uh, cuts out. I told nobody to phone me, but nobody yeah, listens. Switch, you should switch your phone to do not disturb. That's what I do because I have the same problem. Uh, there you go. Good idea, Paul. Tile magician, not tech magician. <laughs> I mean, what do you want from me? Um, okay, so just funnily enough, when you, uh, once you jumped off the show there, um, yeah. the add pictures icon showed up again. So that must be it. I'm assuming Instagram switched it up. So. It is what it is. You guys are stuck looking at us for now until we figure out a way around this. I tried to put some nice looking stuff in the background for us anyway. Okay, so, so just combing the thin set in one direction as opposed to like a, you, you often see guys swirling the thin set around and then you see them like slapping big blobs on the back. I mean, the, the quickest way to put thin set down is to slop it all over. And then the easiest way to achieve like a level floor is to put big blobs on the back. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's it doesn't matter what tile it is or how good the tile setter is. If you install a tile like that, you're, you're rolling the dice. If you take thin set and you notch it in a continuous line in each direction, when you collapse those ridges, the air can escape and you can smack that tile with a hammer and the hammer will bounce right back off of it. If you take the exact same tile installed with like circular motion uh, thin set and you take a hammer and you smash it, the tile will explode everywhere. It's the most incredible thing to wouldn't think that just the way you comb your mortar has any effect on the situation. Again, it looks good, but it doesn't function the same way. And 
you know, that's, that's, that's a huge, uh, you know, like you say, I mean, you wouldn't really know that until it started failing. And most people think it's like the, the floor, the substrate is doing this, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 oh, there's too much flex in the floor. It's almost never too much flex in the floor. It's either improper combing of the thin set or it's uh, the floor is expanding and contracting the wood underneath it, which is why we use a membrane. And in very rare circumstances, it's the floor ends up heating up too fast and it expands and you end up like with tiles popping and creating a ridge. But uh, there's all kinds of like little tiny details that are easily missed by even the most seasoned veteran tile installer that can cause, you know, catastrophic failures in the most simple mm -hmm. basic installations. So there's- Yeah, we had one actually, I mentioned it last time you were on the show. We did a curbless shower, it must've been five or six years ago now. So back then in our world, it was a newer technology. And one of my tile setters at the time, he was a very skilled guy. He, he said, yeah, I can do this for you, no problem. So he explained the process to me, how he was going to do it, made total sense. We were there the whole step for the checking in, making sure we're happy with it. And in the end, about a month after turnover, all of a sudden the client complained a bunch of water in her ceiling in the room below the bathroom. And we were like, that doesn't make any sense. How could this be? And we went looking at it and basically make a long story short, he forgot to silicone the joint from the floor to the wall tile. And then the way he built the system, enough water got through that, it ran over top of the membrane and then carried out to where the membrane ended and then yeah. like, into the room below, right? So it ended up being something that, um, you know, very simple, a couple little mistakes the guy made along the way, but, you know, he was talking to his rep at the time and he followed their instructions and it was such a simple little thing that failed. And I warned the client after like, well, based on how this was installed, according to how the distributor of these products suggested they be installed for warranty purposes, you now need to make sure that you maintain your silicone in that shower, like, you know, diligently, right? So, yeah, so that's got, you know, what that is, that water migration is, is a problem that hasn't been addressed, um, it, or sorry, has been addressed in, the TTMAC handbook, which is the Tile Terrazzo Marble Association, it's sort of like the the guideline that uh, that that like if there is a dispute, it's like, well, did you do it this way? It's it's the book, right? And the guidelines have stipulated for years that you have to have a certain amount of mortar coverage, but now with these large format tiles, these huge tiles, and um, uh, the, 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 the clips and the leveling systems that we use, uh, mortar coverage is becoming less and less and often guys get away with it. But that migration that you just talked about, Paul, is becoming a major issue. So you're, you're laying these massive tiles, way back, huge tiles, right, on top of walls. And, uh, and then you stick the glass. I'm going to grab a piece of tile there. Sure. Piece of tile. Then we come in and we stick the piece of glass over top of it like this, right? Well, when the what if the water gets in here and it actually goes behind the tile under the glass outside mm -hmm. waterproofing out the other side? The only way to prevent that from happening is is really good coverage, really good mortar coverage on the back of your tiles. So now we're actually seeing guys with these huge tiles using vibrators. Like they use like big machines that go and like vibrate the mortar into the wall to make sure that there's good contact for it. So mm -hmm. I know he's doing something wrong and he can be an incredible tile setter that takes tremendous pride in his work and like does everything he can to achieve a beautiful end result. But if the coverage isn't there and some water gets into a hole, it just fills up and makes its way out the, so, Migration that what you just uh, talked about with that barrier free shower is, is becoming a huge problem with these massive tiles that we're using these days. Mm -hmm. So make sure, especially like, on, make sure it's full. <laughs> of yeah, for sure. And that goes back to what we talked about initially. I wish I could show you the picture of how you would apply, you know, the, the mortar to the backside or to the wall, to the tile, to the floor, whatever it is. You see these guys doing little dollops and you have these cavities underneath and that's, that's not going to do it. But a couple of questions asking about what was the name of that video you called? Was it uh, Trowel and Error? Yeah, Trowel, like the like a notch trowel. Trowel and Error. Okay, there you the, go. The custom building products did about how to apply thin set mortar. And it's, it's so simple 
and it's insane. Like for a tile guy, it's you know I don't want to be overly dramatic, but it's it's like a game changing sort of life changing video. You'll never comb thin set the same way again after watching it. That's for sure. Yeah, nice. So I guess another thing we should talk about about is another issue, an install issue I see often, and that's um, lipage. Some call it cupping, whatever that, however you want to call it. And again, I wish I could show you guys some pictures, but basically what it is is when you have um, it depends depend on your layout too, but typically most tile is not perfectly flat, right? Is that called rectified? Is that what a rectified tile is? Uh, no, rectified is square, is uh, there you go. the squareness, but the flatness of the tile is, uh, it's just sort of warped, it's just warping, yeah. Yeah, so then what happens when you have typically the, the highest point of the warp, I guess we'll say, will be in the center of the tile, right? And then if you have your, if you do a 50-50 layout or something like that, where the lowest part on the edge meets up to the highest point in the center, then you see a big deflection within, you know, the finished surface. And again, a picture would say a thousand words and avoid me having to mumble my way through this one, but um, it's a problem. So I guess in the end, I, in my experience, it comes down to the quality of the product you're selecting to install. And then also it comes down to the ability of the tile setter to be able to manage those issues and, communicate strategies to avoid major issues on finishing by planning a layout that makes good sense according to the tile you've selected. So what are your thoughts on, on that, Aaron? Well, again, because there are no real standards, um, there are in a book, like it'll tell you that a tile this size, you know, is allowed this much lippage over this distance if the grout line is this wide. And I mean, it's, it's, there is a scientific formula that they've come or that they've come out with in order to sort of like, in the case of a legal sort of scenario, you could fall upon, but or fall back on. But um, you know, lippage by today's standards really isn't acceptable. There's so many ways to deal with it now um, with these leveling systems. Um, a lot of it comes down to prep work. Guys don't want to do the proper prep work or they don't, they're, you know what, you know what's happening. Paul, you know this better than anyone. The renovation, the renovators and the builders know this as well is you're afraid to quote a job properly done because you're always going to be higher, right? You're like, you're, you're, you're afraid to say like, well, if we do it right, it's going to be this much money. And it's almost like, so guys aren't going to even quote prep work, you know, so with larger tiles, especially if you're staggering the joints, if we want to do like a 50-50 stagger or something like that, um, you stand a better chance of having that, that lippage occur. The other thing it comes down to as well is, um, you know, uh, the, the tile installer's tolerance for lippage. You know, there's tile guys out there that have like lippage all over the floor and they're like, yeah, so like, it's not that bad. Like, what's the big deal? That's how tile floors are. And then you get other guys, you know, that will go, they'll kill themselves. For, they'll spend 45 minutes on one tile to get it mm -hmm. quickly level. And so a lot of it comes down to the, how much the tile installer wants to make it good because can it be perfect? Pretty much almost without exception. Um, yeah, it can be for sure. And let, let's talk about something for a second because you just, you, you poke me in a sore spot. So first of all, let's reintroduce the show. If you're just tuning in, this is the Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster from Contact Renovation and Custom Homes. Today, we're talking about bathroom tile. And I have tile expert Aaron Brown from the River City Tile Company. I know nobody likes to be called an expert. I don't like it either, but I'm pointing that finger at you. Um, anyhow, so if you're just tuning in, we're talking about tile. And, you know, you need to be careful about when you, ch you pick your tile setter, maybe you have multiple quotes. You need to know what you're going to get, what's included, and what quality of finish will you have, but more importantly, what's behind the scenes, what's behind the tile, how's it been installed, and will it hold up? So, Aaron, you just mentioned something about, you know, builders and contractors being afraid to quote things the way they should be, and it, you know, it drives me crazy, because I always quote it the way it needs to be done. I come to the table, I bring a real number. Yeah. done properly to adhere to best practice. I'm super transparent, open about it. Yeah. But look, it's going to cost more this way, but this is the right way to do it. I give people good allowances 
for their products. So you, you go to the showroom, they have lots of options available. They can choose to save money if they want to. Everyone goes, oh, no, that's fantastic. We love that. But when it comes time to pick their contractor, they can't shy away from the guy that's $10,000 less or whatever the number is. So we lose a ton of work because other people come in and give a really attractive number up front. Yep. And I know this guy, the client, is going to pay what I quoted. Eventually, they're going to pay that. Yep. Either through change <laughs> orders or through upgrades. Yeah. It drives me bonkers because in the end, I just want to come like straight forward with my numbers. Here's what you need. If you say you want good, better, or best, you want best, I'm going to quote you best. You want better, I'll give you better. If you want yeah. best, if you want code minimum, I'm not your guy. That's because right. code minimum is not set up for a win for anybody. And I don't be back on warranty calls. So, sorry, I don't mean to complain about stuff here, but you touched me in a tender spot because in the end, that's my struggle. And I know it is for anybody trying to do the best they can with what they deliver, right? I know you're one of those guys too. Yeah. No, and I just wanted to bring it up because, um, you know, I know that there's people watching that are probably considering a reno, for example. And, um, you know, you kind of outlined the show for me a little bit today. One of the things you'd sort of written out there in your bullet points was, you know, the educated client on exactly what it is that they're getting. And to be honest, Paul, we take it for granted. And it's something that we struggle with immensely uh, at River City Tile Company. It's like, we don't really have like a, uh, like a good, better, best in some, you know, for most cases when it comes to the technical side. In other words, like, you know, for what mortar we use or our best installation, Aesthetically, yeah, we have, you know, you want a metal trim or do you want a marble trim? You know, do you want a, a metal corner or do you want a mitered corner? You know, those types of things come into play. But, um, you know, generally speaking, I think, if you know, if clients are educated properly, and I'll give you a really good example, we lost a huge job. Like, this is like one of the most prominent residences in the entire city. And um, we quoted this job and we quoted it with like heated floors and heated, you know, benches in the showers and heated backrests. I mean, it's a multi-million dollar project. So we're going to give our quotes going to reflect the, the, the sort of the type of project we we're working on. And uh, not only did we lose it based on price, uh, because the other guy didn't include any of that in the price, we lost it because uh, one of the stone materials that the, the design at spec we know from our own experience as well as um, members of the uh, of the uh, Marble Institute of America will say you can't use that stone in a shower so we, we said you know here's the price for that stone by the way you can't use it in a shower but the other guy who's never worked with that stone before and didn't know what it was didn't say anything about using it or not using it in a shower so it's easier to go with that guy because um, then we don't have to worry about uh, you know finding another stone right so <laughs> fact that all that stone has since been replaced so you know there's uh, not that i get satisfaction out of that but i'm just saying like you know educating your clients is super duper important managing expectations like even going back to the conversation about lippage you know um you know when i tell a client that they're going to get a good job what i mean is like if you've got lippage on your floor like we'll get rid of it for you or luckily for me my guys don't you know leave any behind usually but mm -hmm. It's uh, education and managing expectations, I think, for any trade. It isn't just tile. Um, is super important. Like, it's everything, really. Absolutely. I mean, across the board, I think, you know, and I say this all the time on the show, it's your project's only as good as your plan. And your plan's only as good as, has, as detailed as it is. And as thorough as much you've thought it out, planned it, they have all of the I's dotted and T's crossed. Sounds cliched, I know, but... You know, and if you look at your product and go, look, I got, this is the tile they want. They want it in this layout. Okay. And it's going in this area. Well, that raises a whole bunch of extra questions, right? Based on your layout or your pattern, are you going to have potential lippage issue with this product? Should we go to something else? Is maybe it not intended for where you want to put it? Um, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, that anyways, so for sure, client education is key. Um, let's open up the, I guess the whatever the comments. Anybody has any questions to ask Aaron or I about tile setting or anything to do with, I guess anything. Want to ask Aaron where he got his shirt? You can ask him that question too. But uh, yeah, fire away. We'd be happy to answer some questions for a bit here. We've got 15 minutes left. Um, 
we'll move on and talk about some other stuff here, but any questions, we're happy to talk about them and answer them for you. Um, what, what do you see out there, Aaron, right now that is, um, you know, I guess, well, well, I hate using the word trend, but are there trends that are coming up in tile that you see that are like super exciting for you? And there are some that you're shying away from going, Whoa, I don't know if I, if I believe that or trust it yet. Where yeah. do you stand with those? Super good question. So I think I'll answer that first by defining what, what we consider trendy. Cause we get that out. We get that question all the time. You know, is this trendy? Am I going to be sick of this in five years from now or whatever? And the simplest question you should ask yourself when it comes to trendiness is like, is there technology come along five years that will make what you're looking at obsolete? So um, we're seeing a huge revert back to the basic, like the elemental form of things. So real stone, uh, real terracotta, you know, real handmade ceramic, encaustic cement, like the, these are elemental, right? So there's, there's no amount of technology that will ever exist that can make those obsolete. Sure, technology exists to make a fake version of those things. So that's what drives trends and that is, that's what makes things trendy. So right now there's like a big, it's called Zalige tile. It's a handmade, uh, you know, it, it started in Morocco and, and uh, they've been making these hand chiseled, hand terracotta tiles for hundreds of years. Got a piece here. Actually see this sort of like really organic edge that's on there. Entry ceramic uh, tile making very popular right now that real sort of organic natural look is really really in and um of course because it's so popular there's all kinds of manufacturers of a fake version of it so let's say in 10 years from now when this trend has run its course what's going to happen is that the people that bought the not real version are just going to be left with a trendy you know flavor of the week whereas the people that have the real version I mean, this has been around for hundreds of years, right? And so you will be able to lean on that authenticity, mm -hmm. uh, carry it through the trendy period. You know what I mean? So things that are authentic, I think brass is a really good example. We're seeing even behind me and there's some brass uh, inlaid marble over there. And uh, yeah. if it's brass, then brass has never gone out of style. Um, when we start spray painting things gold, and calling it brass look and it becomes uh so available that like literally like superstore is selling uh you know brass look everything so mm -hmm. that's when trends sort of come and go there's no amount of technology that will ever advance that will make brass obsolete because brass is elemental so yeah true enough we got a couple questions here yeah. um we got wendy carswell asking any backsplash suggestions for an off-white cream cupboard Oh, back off white backsplash ab above, I guess, around cream cupboards. I guess that's a tough one, Wendy. I don't know if you're asking about a product, a color. Um, if you can maybe clarify that, we can be more specific about the answer. Um, well, we have another one here from Design Halco. When incorporating a niche into a shower, are there any considerations from a tile pr perspective to keep in mind, uh, specifically dimensions, for example? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, you want to have enough room to get your Costco size shampoo with the pump in there. As far as practical purposes are concerned, I mean, like any tile guy can, I mean, I've done some sh some showers that have like a grocery aisle worth of niches in there all over, like six, seven of them and, and everything. So anything can be done, but I guess from, you know, exterior walls, you don't want to put a niche on an exterior wall would be probably mechanical you don't want to sacrifice your your the, the, how your uh, shower functions because you want to have a niche in a certain place or whatever but as far as size or or location i mean like you can you know you can do whatever you want i would avoid uh i'll say this just as a favor to everybody um i would avoid the pre-made like schluter niches or the pre-made weed niches, for example um they're so expensive like they're just it's just and you yeah they're just it's just as easy to make one yourself. <laughs> we yeah, do have sure enough. One thing I'd say too with the niches to consider is the niche height. We just went through this recently and the designer wanted the bottom of the niche at a certain height. 
Um, but then when we looked at, like you said, the Costco size bottle of shampoo, the client would have had to reach up almost overhead to reach the little like dispenser yeah. portion of it. So it was way too high. So we, in the end, like to make sure we keep niches at a practical height, um, depending what you're putting there. You want to put, you know, your razors on there, then put them up high out of the way so your kids can't reach them. But you put in shampoo there, make sure you can reach the, the top of it so you can access your shampoo without, um, you know, running the risk of slipping and falling down in your shower. So yeah. um, there's my two bits on niches. So Wendy Carswell, she's clarifying the color she's referring to. And is the trend on backsplashes to go shiny if your cupboards are flat? And before um, Aaron jumps in, I'd say there's such a wide variety of colors and products now, Wendy. It's like, I think many different designers will go a different direction with that. And I think ultimately for you, you need to decide what do you want to be the focal point in your kitchen? Is it your cabinet, your countertop, your backsplash tile? Is it going to be that sink? And I think that's what one thing to consider for you is what, you know, do you want that backsplash to pop? If you do, then there you go. Color and texture and pattern all the way. Backsplash always wins, Paul. Doesn't matter. You can have the most expensive, most outrageously exotic countertop in the world. The backsplash always wins. Everyone knows that. No, we don't all know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't I've had some clients very specific about look I'm putting a bunch of money in these countertops I just want everything to basically like flow with the countertop or accent it somehow so ask that client because we get that a lot in fact I probably have that conversation every time I ask these clients you know when you think about all the pictures of backsplashes that you've seen what countertop did they use to go with it and they can't tell you because you can't see the countertop in a kitchen picture because it's laying down flat don't make your countertop the focal point of the kitchen. Right. There you go. Um, we got uh, Ziad asking, how much would it cost to make a niche versus a prefab? Oh, man, that's a good question. Like the prefab ones like are hundreds of dollars, right? And so if we're doing a niche, we still have to tile it. We still have to waterproof it. We still have prefab one. So the difference is like a piece of two by four, really, you know, and often what we recommend to people is that, uh, um, you know, we're kind of, so we figure out like approximately if we could have the niche here and it's between two, two by fours, which gives us about a 14 inch net width. Um, and then I always tell my clients, just, just leave it long, like leave it way open. And then that way we can just put a piece of two by four when we do our waterproofing mm -hmm. and we can adjust that height to match the, um, the, the tile, the grout lines, right? So the width is sort of determined by the two by fours. And yeah. then we can kind of play with as we get into the laying out of the tile. But well, I can tell you one thing though, the, this is actually not dictated by the two by fours because we reframe shower walls all the time yeah. to put a niche exactly where we need it. It's not without exception, but generally right. speaking, the path is sure. And yeah. those bad ones are designed to go between two by fours, right? 68. Yeah. For sure. I mean, you'd be surprised and you, maybe you've got a better system than I do, but the amount of time we put into reframing walls to make sure that the, the niche is exactly where it's going to be and grout lines all line up and we had a full tile, like a lot of planning goes into where we place our niches. Yep. Um, specifically if you have some high profile tile job going in. Right. So um, I look forward to the day where I could just make it someone else's problem. But for now, I still am heavily involved in, in those kind of layouts. Yeah. And I guess because I'm, I'm detail orientated in that sense. So I guess that I'm the right guy for the job. But yeah. um, in any case, um, we got any more questions in here? I don't see any more. We got about five minutes left. Um, Aaron, how do people get a hold of you? Usually I'm gonna, I would post your information on the screen right now and say, all right, here's how you get a hold of the River City Tile Company. Um, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, right now, the best way is probably, um, you know, through our website, if you Google us, uh, um, uh, we're by a point. Rivercitytilecompany.com, is that what it is? Rivercitytilecompany.com. Okay, I'm going to just post it here. Mm -hmm, bear with me. Mm -hmm, big fat thumbs, trying to do this quickly. I think I got it right. And here you go. A hold of us. Um, we, we, we take, you know, we get a lot of appointment requests through Instagram. Uh, we get a lot of questions through Instagram. Um, so yeah, 
yeah, social media, I guess. And uh, our, our website's the best way because if you Google us, you got our phone number, mm -hmm. our address is there. You can make an appointment request from our website. And um, yeah, you come on in. It will tell you that our hours are, I can't remember exactly what they say, but we do take appointment requests like after hours or on weekends as well. So we want to make it as uh, simple as possible for, to accommodate people. Um, especially, you know, during the COVID times, you want to keep everyone, you know, safe and confident that they're shopping in a safe environment. So that's, that's, uh, you know, something that we're still dealing with here, but, uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully soon we'll be able to open it up. We're a little overwhelmed with, um, with a, a point request right now. I'm not going to lie. So it might, you might not be able to just say, well, I'm, I want a four o'clock appointment on Thursday. It might not be, right. but we're pretty flexible. So um we're working with uh, yeah we're working all the time so let us know <laughs> let us know yeah, what I'll say, as far as like when you go in there like we went you know you guys did a little job for me at home recently and we didn't know quite what we wanted we had an idea and we came in and looked at your tile and to me the coolest thing about the experience they were talking to you was when we left there we didn't have a specific tile in mind. Well, I guess we kind of did, but basically the plan was to cut a bunch of tile up into small pieces and make some sort of a, a not really a mosaic, but it was truly this little custom, it was for our hearth on our fireplace. And it's, you know, we have some um, cement tile we have in our front entry. So we use a product that was just like that from your, I think it was from your G online. Yeah. And then uh, we combined it with some other white tiles to black. We cut it up into little strips. We got pieces of brass inlaid in there. And let me tell you, I had a picture to show you today, but um, <laughs> I can't. So I'll just, you know, anyways, my point is you can go in there, you can get creative. And that's, that I think is key because tile really can be a showstopper if you let it be. And um, just be careful who you hire to do it if that's your goal. Well, even if it's not a showstopper, you need to know, you need to know it's done right. Because if it leaks, that's a problem bigger than you can comprehend right now. Because um, if it's not done right and water's getting in, there's really only one right way to fix that. And that's to take it all back out and start fresh. Um, and, you know, nobody wants to do that. Anyways, uh, we had another quick question here. Um, Spit Me Some Fires asking, what's your favorite tile right now? Oh, man, I don't know. Like, I... I love like all the classic, classic stuff again, like elemental. So I'm like a, a very traditional in my own aesthetic. But right now we have this unglazed Japanese porcelain mosaic in these like little sticks. And it's like raccoon pottery on mesh. And it's just like the most beautiful thing. And uh, it's so simple, but it's just so good. And so I don't know, it's, it's changing all the time, Paul. <laughs> and, yeah. and, so much good stuff and some of the stuff that we've had in our showroom for 10 years is still some of my favorite stuff so i don't know right now that's the flavor of the week as far as i'm concerned yeah, yeah you have so much cool stuff in the shop there it'd be hard to pick one for sure uh, i've got about a minute or so left um for danny Riedel out there would love to see your photo i'll post the picture of my fireplace hearth um in my stories later and you can see what we're talking about. And it's not done. We still have like a metal wood holder, fireplace detail to go in and some, some shelves I'm making, but we'll show you the hearth at the very least. Uh, thanks again, Aaron, for that. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for coming on the show. This has been the Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster from Contact Renovations and Custom Homes. We have Aaron Brown from River City Tile Company, the tile magician. Maybe I'll call you a wizard next time. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thank you, back next week. Next week's kind of a Q&A show. So it's basically, I'm going to answer a bunch of questions we've been asked. Uh, people have a chance to join in and participate. And uh, it'll be a bit different than the usual show. But you need some tile. You want to talk to an expert, go to the River City Tile Company. You've got a bigger project that incorporates tile in addition to other work. And you need someone to oversee the big picture. Then maybe I'm your man. And if not, I'll find someone who is for you. But you have questions reach out i'm always happy to help out and share my knowledge i love what i do and uh i have lots of fun doing it so don't be shy thanks for tuning in aaron thanks again always a pleasure thanks talk soon take care bye-bye